well, let's just say all three of us are Caucasian, all three of us 20 minutes in the sun, let's just say 20 minutes in the sun, we start to turn pink. When we start to turn pink, our body is telling us you're getting burnt. You know, you probably ought to get out of the sun. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. You are listening to the Dr. Haley Show podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Haley. Today's guest is Dr. Gary Groon. Gary is a surfer and chemical engineer. His surfer life revealed the dangers of excessive sun exposure, and his chemistry knowledge revealed the dangers of toxic chemicals and hormone disruptors in cosmetics. This inspired him to figure out a way to make a safe sunscreen that actually worked that applied easily and lasted in water. Through his efforts, he developed such a product and with the help of his 13-year-old daughter, named it Third Rock Sunblock. Eventually, the creation of additional products with the same standards bloomed into Third Rock Essentials. This episode is sort of a geeky product review. Gary's high standards makes him a customer at Haley Nutrition and my high standards made me a customer of Third Rock Essentials. I only wish I had known of them sooner. Enjoy the show. Gary, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank you for sending those awesome products. I have them right here, and I this is kind of a product review, and some of them we have questions about because we're not sure what they are. Right. But the first one that Michelle had tried was the lip balm. Oh, yeah. Hi, Michelle. Hi. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't introduce That's okay. you. That's okay. And I, I was upstairs here, and I heard her from downstairs say, oh, I love the lip balm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing to hear. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> so I'm assuming I was wondering... that you use the Neutroleum product that has the beeswax in it, which is the water-resistant version? Yep. That would be this one. Yep. Yeah, that's the water-resistant version. There's also a water-soluble version. One has beeswax, one doesn't. And the oh, one this that, one definitely has bee, beeswax, right? Yeah. I don't know. If it, it says like water it. resistant, then it has beeswax. Does it, well, both of us are holding it at a distance. It's oh, there it is. Yeah, well, it is okay. small, right? Water resistant. Water resistant. Water resistant, yeah. yeah. So that that has so what makes it water resistant is the beeswax. Okay, it tastes good too. Yeah, it yeah, does. It does. <laughs> it, I call it synthetic honey. But there's nothing, nothing synthetic about it. So uh, that product was a mistake in the laboratory. <laughs> no way. Oh, great. Let me wipe it off. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, no, the funny thing is, is and I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I'm typically the one that uses like a, a, a chapstick type product on my cuticles. To right. me, that's like the place for it. But yep, And it yep. feels great there. Yeah. Well, so what happened was... <laughs> It was because everything came because of the sunscreen. But what happened was uh, we use glycerin, vegetable base, which is palm oil based uh, extracted glycerin, which is USP grade kosher glycerin and USP, US pharmaceutical grade, sorry. And we mix that with something called ceteroglucoside. Ceteroglucoside is an emulsifier, but it's a plant fat. So if you've ever boiled vegetables and you've ever seen the little globules that come to the top of the boiling pot, that mixture of the glycerin and the ceteroglucoside makes a really cool gel. It wasn't cool from the fact that it gelled and we can't make sunscreen with the gel, <clears throat> but it was because we were prepping for the sunscreen and we added too much ceteroglucoside and there it is, the gel that you see. So we patented it, of course, because I do patent work for a living. I'm a registered patent agent. So that is a patented product. It is food grade edible. All of our products are, and to make it water resistant, we add beeswax, which is high mountain desert beeswax from one farm in Arizona. 
That, that's pretty cool. You know, it's funny. Um, I think a lot of the best products in the world were actually invented by mistake. You know, I, I think that's how wine was invented. Right. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, yourself. Now, what's your training? You're, you're a chemist. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm, at, I'm actually sitting at Duke University where I did my undergraduate degree. And uh, because I teach here too, I teach uh, the Master's of Engineering Management program. So I have a BSME, which is a bachelor's degree in, in mechanical engineering and material science, uh, but I also double majored in chemistry. Uh, so when I graduated Duke, I went to work for a couple of years at Celanese. Then I went back to school at UMass Amherst and got my master's degree in chemical engineering. And then I took a job at IBM in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. I then uh, qualified for what they call the resident study program at IBM. They paid for my doctorate at NC State in chemical engineering. I left I IBM after 13 years and I became the sustainability director for transmission and distribution on Centennial campus at NC State University. Uh, and that lasted a few years until I got an offer. I couldn't refuse to go to Chesapeake, Virginia to work for the Mitsubishi Chemical, which is Mitsubishi Chemical America. And then I became a registered patent agent and did all the patent development work for Mitsubishi in the United States uh, and working with the Japanese, of course, and learned a lot about the Japanese patent system and <clears throat> then started my own company, Sunblock Incorporated. And I also started up a biofuels company, all of which involved people from either the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina or some of the people that I've worked with over the years in the health and wellness space. But you're no longer Third Rock Sunblock. You're we're not, Third we're not. We're Third Rock. Well, Third Rock Sunblock Incorporated is the company, but we're doing business as Third Rock Essentials. Because you decided to add some other products. That's right. Now, here's that's what... exactly right. It, it, it all started just with sunscreen, and that's all we made for the first few years. Um, and all we made was the aromatherapeutic version. And then we, we realized a lot of people like unscented. So we said, well, we just not add the rosemary and the frankincense. And then all these other things happened, like the lip balm that you and Michelle like. So um, all of that, like I said, some of it were mistakes in the lab. Some of them were created out of request or need. And that's how Third Rock Essentials grew out of Third Rock Sunblock. Okay. Michelle, I want you to be completely transparent. <laughs> and what was your, what did you say to me about the sunblock? It's okay. We get a lot of, we get a lot of uh, negative uh, feedback because there's a lot of things about oh, the sunscreen people well, don't understand. Let, let me, let me, let me, and you can figure out how you're going to say this. Okay. See, because we set out to make the world's healthiest sunscreen. We didn't want chemicals in it. And it's funny because you're a, a, a chemist and, yep. and you don't use chemicals, but you avoid <laughs> them right. at all costs. It, which is kind of funny because I, I speak chemistry, you know, I could speak right. SP2, SP3 hybridizations and high isomers and all kinds of stuff. Sure. Uh, but I was never a chemist. I never, you know, was a, a laboratory person use, mixing these together. I never had the, you know, laboratory experience that you, I would assume, have oh, yes. with your history. <laughs> And then somehow you learn to abandon that to make things that avoided all that. <laughs> so when we worked with people that had your kind of knowledge in the chemistry and they would say, well, you got to put this in, we'll figure out some way to do it without putting that in it. And we tried right. to work with the chemists to avoid all the chemicals. Right. And we came up with something that worked really well, right. but it didn't spread nicely. Uh -huh. And it was a challenge. And you know, we found out it eventually expired. We didn't sell it fast enough. Right. I'm told that it doesn't actually expire, that the zinc oxide doesn't expire, but it actually starts caking at some point in time. Ah, Oddly, yeah. ours never really caked, but it, it, it did the same thing it did from the start because it would never spread really nicely anyway. Right. Now, with all of that said, and, you know, we, we, we didn't want to add water. We wanted to use only aloe in place of water when that we made it. That originally as well. All right. So with that, what would you say? I said that I liked yours better than ours. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good thing. Um, and again, of course, that's very subjective. So let me explain our sunscreen because I think that's really what you want to hear a little bit about, right? 
Yeah. Well, we have questions about a lot of the products here. <laughs> okay. Well, do you want to start with the sunscreen or something else? Yeah. Yes. Let's start. Okay. With it. Okay. So first of all, the way this all started was I surf. So I had two young guys that got melanoma, different times, different doctors got told the same thing at age 20. They got told, keep surfing, you'll get melanoma again. They stopped surfing at age 20. One was actually 17 when he was diagnosed. The other was 20 and was surfing with us regularly at the Outer Banks. So at the same time that that happened, that I learned how to surf, which was not until I was 30, and, and these were younger kids that I was surfing with, and I always learned something from younger people. I didn't expect to learn that. I also went to Australia in 1992. And in Australia, if you may remember, I don't know, I don't know if you're, well, Michelle's definitely too young. You might be old enough. <laughs> but uh, you might remember they had an ozone issue. There was a big ozone hole over Australia and it was a big deal. Well, when I was there, all they talked about was the UV index and the pollution, unfortunately, in, in uh, Bondi Bay and those areas. So they were using titanium dioxide in their sunscreens. And I brought some back with me thinking, you know, why don't we use that in the United States? Well, that was 1992. Fast forward to 2000. And in 2000, I was already working up here in Virginia Beach. Well, I'm, I'm in Durham today, but in Virginia Beach where I live. And so there was an article. I'm an ACS member, American Chemical Society. As a member, you get a weekly journal. Front page cover was, are sunscreens safe? This is 2000, okay? And I started reading the article. It was by Margaret Schlumpf, who was a toxicologist at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And her paper was on the fact that she was lathering the back of female rats with organic, quote unquote, organic transparent sunscreens. And the rats, the female rats uterus was growing abnormally large. And she determined they were all endocrine disruptors, female mimicking hormones. Well, I didn't know anything about that. I'm not a toxicologist and I'm certainly not a biochemist, but I knew one thing. I didn't want female mimicking hormones on my male body. And I certainly didn't want that in the presence of the sun because I was concerned that, you know, I might get skin cancer too. And so when we, at that time, people were already starting to question, you know, are sunscreen safe? Am I better off with no sunscreen? That kind of thing. And it's come full circle here 20 years later, 24 years later. So I actually wrote a patent application and got it granted on a non-endocrine disrupting, cytoprotective, immuno-enhancing sunscreen. And that is a lot. Um, and so my goal was to license it or sell it to some big company. And that wasn't happening. So I started working in my garage to make the sunscreen. And I started out with Burt's Bees formula stuff because Burt's at the time was the 800 pound gorilla in the natural personal care space. And I liked using their base to make my sunscreen, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So I had to get mixing equipment, which I borrowed from my lab at Mitsubishi. I had to get a place to, to make it. And I had to start experimenting with exactly what you said, aloe and zinc. And I made an aloe and zinc combination and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And most of the time it didn't. And I tried it on my uh, wife and kids at the time and they suffered. So I said, well, I can't keep doing it that way. So then I started trying to get people like Bocce Labs to make it for me. And they were all old school chemists who didn't understand the concept of non-endocrine disrupting. And they didn't understand that it had to be food grade edible. And we say, if you wouldn't put it in your mouth, why would you put it on your skin? Your skin's your biggest organ. So all of those requirements, they didn't get it. So at the same time, my kinesiologist chiropractor, I think I mentioned to you, Dr. John Schmidt, or John said, I want to help you with the sunscreen. Let's see what we can do to make it proactive and make it immuno enhancing. And that's where the rosemary and the frankincense came in for the aromatherapeutic version. But as you know, aloe also is a protectorant against precancerous lesions and cancer itself, skin cancer and other, uh, of course, drinking it is different than applying it, but still your skin's your biggest organ. So when we did all that, we realized in testing over 200 patients that the rosemary and frankincense combination muscle tested positive. And I am a scientist and an engineer and I don't believe in hokey stuff. So I wanted to prove that my ability to understand the neuromuscular response from the nose and the mouth going straight to the brain, which is very powerful, if that's really scientifically also capable of being understood. What we did was we took all of the non-active ingredients that you would put into a sunscreen, and we tested them both for muscle testing 
and for something which is a bioassay, because Dr. Schmidt's first client is Dr. George Clark, who actually lives and works in Durham, has a lab, and he determined using a bioassay with luciferase enzymes, whether something is an endocrine disruptor or not, down to the 10 to the minus 16th power. Mm. We published that paper in the Journal of Toxicology in 2005. I did not get to go to present the paper in San Diego because my daughter's birthday was that week, and I think she was turning five or something. And so the people that presented it, one person who presented it, John Gordon, came back and told me that uh, L'Oreal came up after the talk and said, we're glad you didn't put our information in there about our sunscreen. So in that Journal of Toxicology report, which I'm happy to disseminate to anybody you want, including yourselves, we showed there's a correlation between muscle testing and endocrine disruption, which is our definition of toxicity is cell death. And when cells die, what happens in that bioassay is the luminescence from the luciferous enzyme, which is fireflies, lightning bugs, use that to light up, that dims the light. So if the cells die, they become dark and the light doesn't fluoresce through it as readily as it would without that. So that was my way of proving and putting in my patent that I could prove that we had a non-endocrine disrupting substance. Very important to me. Uh, I don't believe in phytoestrogens either. We don't use soy. We don't use any compounds in our products that are phytoestrogenic based. With one exception in that we are changing the formula on, which is our liver cleanse product. We'll get to that later. So then the ch challenge was, what am I going to do? I know I want to use zinc only. Mark Michnick had several patents and became a billionaire selling those patents to BASF for something called Z-Code, which is the first nanotechnology product really on the market, which is zinc oxide, pure zinc oxide. The problem with zinc code is that it's not surface treated. And when they did start surface treating it, they started surface treating it with silicone oil. Well, Burt's Bees hired me to become their SPF director in 2005 to 2007. We negotiated for 18 months. And then at the end of 2007, they sold the company to Clorox for $987 million. It turns out Burt's Bees is also listed right here, right down the street in Durham, North Carolina. That's their headquarters. Well, what happened was I got a call from Celeste Lutriano. She was the uh, chemist, the head chemist for, for Burt's at the time that I started working with them. And she said, we can't use your zinc. It's got silicon oil in it. And I said, Celeste, it's not got silicon oil on it. It's surface treated with silicon oil so that it doesn't turn into oatmeal. Well, I didn't know about the oatmeal part. So I naively said, okay, Celeste, I'll make it without the silicon treated surface. I'll just make it with pure zinc oxide and everything else. So I would ship them the product that I made. This is like a nine month period of development of the product with Burt's Bees. And about two weeks, three weeks later, it would turn into oatmeal. And the reason for that is zinc oxide, when you don't treat the surface of it somehow, it is a very strong catalyst. It'll react with everything and anything. So now I had a dilemma. I couldn't use a surface treated synthetic composition on the surface of the zinc oxide. And you know what they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So what did I do? I started a way of making the zinc oxide not turn into zinc hydroxide, which is what happens for all mineral sunscreens, whether it's zinc or titanium, they both turn into zinc hydroxide or titanium hydroxide, which is a salt. It is not a metal oxide anymore. So Chuck Friedman opened a lab. He was the guy who did all the Burt's Bees formulations. I met him, he became a friend. I worked in his lab. One night we're working together after hours, of course, because I had a full-time job. And he said, you know, I started measuring the pH. And I realized that the pH of zinc oxide and water starts becoming alkaline. And he said to me, I think you're making zinc hydroxide. Brilliant, brilliant chemist, smart guy, know what he was doing. So I was making zinc hydroxide. So I found this paper, goes back to my original discussion about my background. The Journal of Polymer Science from 1972, published by some people from Japan, showed that at a pH of between nine and a half and 10 and a half, you can't make zinc hydroxide. And at a pH of two to three, you can't make zinc hydroxide. It stays zinc oxide. So now I knew I had to get my pH 
not to acidic, but uh, alkaline, which is nine and a half at least. And how was I going to do that? And also make sure that what I used was food grade edible. Turns out my choice was L-arginine, which is an amino acid, as you probably know, a very healthful amino acid. And so what I do is I chelate the zinc oxide with L-arginine. It brings the pH above nine and a half so that I can't make zinc hydroxide. And I'm the only person on the planet that does it. In fact, if you'd see me three days ago, you would have been laughing at me on Saturday. We had a chelate and centrifuge our zinc oxide. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. So we make a very, very special patented, of course, zinc oxide complex using L-arginine, which prevents it becoming zinc hydroxide so that it never, ever, ever turns into zinc hydroxide, which is why you saw and see mineral sunscreens that turn into toothpaste over time. Our product that you have, I have in my garage from 10 years ago, it hasn't changed in 10 years. It's still wow. the same lotion, the same. Now, there's another thing about it. We don't use water very much. We use water to chelate, but 70% of that product is glycerin. It's not water. And that's why I was worried about what Michelle would say, because there's no other sunscreen on the planet that uses 70% glycerin. They all, and I mean all, use 70% water for two reasons. Water's free, almost. Glycerin's definitely not free. And because it has a different aesthetic feel. So when you put a sunscreen on your skin, it evaporates. This product will never evaporate. Glycerin doesn't even have a boiling point. It has a decomposition temperature of above 320 degrees Fahrenheit. So it will never, ever, ever evaporate. So whatever you take out of that little bottle is going to be on your skin. What does that mean? It's not good for us money-wise. <laughs> we don't make a lot of money on sunscreen because a little dab will do you. You don't need anywhere near as much sunscreen as you would normally lather on yourself because it's not water-based, it's glycerin-based. So it spreads way differently, but when it's on, it's on for good. In an arid environment, which you guys are in Florida, I know, in an arid environment, you wouldn't believe how long it lasts. You can swim all day in Vegas in a swimming pool and you'll still have it on at the end of the day. Wow. So a zinc oxide sunscreen that actually is going to stay on you when you go in the water. Yep. We say we've made what the lifeguards put on their nose into a lotion. Because what the lifeguards put on their nose is pure zinc oxide. And we have pure zinc oxide in our product. Now, there's a huge benefit to that in terms of skin cancer. The huge benefit is that UVA is what causes DNA damage, aging, and wrinkling, and UVA is what causes skin cancer, not UVB. I mean, UVB overexposed for many, many years, maybe, but let me explain. So UVB and UVA, two different wavelengths. Now I have a plot on my website and a plot in the brochure I sent you that shows other mineral sunscreens. It has a green line, a blue line, a red line. It shows absorbance the absorbency over UVB and UVA. Zinc oxide is the best. It's way better than TiO2, titanium dioxide. It's also better than any of the mineral sunscreens. When light hits them, they start to decompose. Zinc and titanium dioxide, especially zinc oxide, does not decompose. Titanium dioxide, there's some papers that say, well, maybe it does split apart. But anyway, why is this important? Well, let's just say all three of us are Caucasian. 
all three of us, 20 minutes in the sun, let's just say 20 minutes in the sun, we start to turn pink. When we start to turn pink, our body is telling us you're getting burnt. You know, you probably ought to get out of the sun. And it turns out your body, which you probably know this, your body needs about 20 minutes of sunlight, direct sunlight to get all the vitamin D you need for the day. So your body's basically saying, look, you got all the vitamin D you need for the day, get out of the sun. Well, you know, the older I get, the longer it takes me to get in the water. But it takes me 20 minutes to get in the water. By that time, I'm by definition overexposed on a day like yesterday or today where the sun's out. So the point being that SPF is sun protection factor. Everybody thinks, oh, I need 30 or I need 40, I need 50. And it turns out the FDA doesn't even allow it to be higher than 50 plus anymore. But what does that mean? So let's just say you buy an SPF 30 product. Ours is 35 plus, doesn't matter. Let's just make it simple. 20 minutes times sun protection factor 30 is 600 minutes of protection from the sun. You're nodding, you understand. That's 10 hours. Well, guess what? First of all, you're not getting 10 hours of protection from any sunscreen that I know of because most of it's going to evaporate off your skin in the first place. But let's just say you got that. It has only to do with UVB. It has nothing to do with UVA. Mm. Not anything okay. to do with UVA. UVA are the long penetrating wet rays. I call them the silent killer rays that penetrate the dermis and the epidermis, the epidermis first and the dermis, and can cause DNA damage. Well, what does that mean? Mutation of the cells. Eventually, not only aging and wrinkling and skin spots or whatever you want to call them, but if your immune system's impaired, skin cancer, like my buddies who were probably eating at McDonald's every day, whose immune system was depressed for some reason, right? Because they're young, they didn't have it in their family. Why else were they getting uh, skin cancer? They were getting overexposed. None of the sunscreens they were using, if they were using any at all, worked. And of course, they were concerned about nothing because they were 20. So my point is, you know, if you're going to make a sunscreen, it's got to be not only UVB, but UVA absorbance or reflectance or both. Because as you probably know, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide also act as tiny mirrors. So they reflect some light as well as absorb it. Whereas the mineral sunscreens only absorb it. And when they absorb it, they break apart into toxic stuff like benzene, which last year was the big thing. Oh, all of a sudden they found benzene in sunscreens. Well, that's really not what happened. What happened was they were formulating the sunscreen with things like avobenzone, oxybenzone. And when those molecules split, benzene is one of the molecules that comes off of that splitting. Um, so that's a lot to take in, but that's the science behind the sunscreen that I've learned over the years. I didn't know this when I started out. And I certainly didn't consider myself an expert in making sunscreens. In fact, I was told by everybody, you'll never make a pure all zinc oxide sunscreen. And of course, you know, I like a challenge, right? So, so <laughs> I, I said, well, never is a long time. I figure I can do it. But I talked to all the right people. I talked to Mark Michnick and his group up in Pennsylvania. And of course, Mark was the guy who really invented nano zinc oxide to make it quote unquote transparent. But as you both found out and know, making a transparent zinc oxide sunscreen is essentially impossible unless you're cheating. So our product is 23 and percent zinc oxide. And what you put on your skin at first is white, but then you see that it absorbs in and the whiteness goes away. And the reason for that is again, it's pure zinc oxide. It's not a salt and it's never going to turn into some like oatmeal toothpaste thing. And of course, by that time, Burt's Bees had long ago canceled the contract with me because they didn't want any loose ends before they sold to Clorox. So my attorney said, you know, you can try and do something with the contract. He said, but they'll try to steal your IP and we think you have something better than anything that Clorox is going to pay you. So just go and commercialize it. Well, you know, it took me 10 years to do that, but eventually, you know, you get there. So the sunscreen, as you have found out, is very different. You need very little. We say just rub a little bit between your hands and then apply to your face because it's a better way to spread it. And also uh, in a cold environment, glycerin, that, and that is a big problem with glycerin. Glycerin in a warm environment in Florida this time of year, it's almost water-like. But if you, and if you leave it in the car, it's pure water-like. But the viscosity changes with temperature. So when you bring it to your favorite ski resort, it's a lot thicker consistency. So you really got to rub and then put it on, which a lot of people I don't want to bother with that, you know, and making a spray. I've done that. I've made a spray out of this product 
The problem with the spray is two things. One is it clogs the nozzle because it's zinc oxide. And the other problem with the spray is that it doesn't really give you the SPF values that you need to make the FDA happy. Uh, whether you know it or not, and I think you do because you've been making sunscreen, uh, the FDA requires at least three things, right? You have to have SPF testing, which is expensive, time consuming, and very uh, erratic, I would say, the SPF numbers. So that's one thing you have to do. You have to have a shelf stable product. So they ask for stability. And then you have to have the micro challenge work done so that no bugs grow in it. Well, of course, with our sunscreen, we don't need an, uh, uh, an antibacterial substance, although the zinc oxide by itself is. But the reason we don't is because the pH is nine and a half. There are uh, hardly any mm. bugs that'll grow in an alkaline environment like that. The other thing about an alkaline environment, which I'm sure you've heard, Dr. Warburg established this back in the late 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, skin cancer cells cannot grow in an alkaline environment. So that's another plus to have an alkaline-based sunscreen. But again, all those things were, were learned over time. <laughs> I would like to sell this here. We could do that. Yeah. And I like both. I like the scented and even the non-scented has like just a clean, clean smell to it. It's really, really Yeah, nice. it's, uh, well, <laughs> so we buy all of our raws. And at one time I was using aloe one for aloe for the sunscreen, but I was like, well, I, I don't know. I, I think the problem was I wanted to make sure, for example, that I had food grade edible only. And, you know, literally the desert stuff, even that has sodium and potassium um, uh, sorbate, right? So I was like, well, I better keep using just pure aloe. Um, so I do. And, um, and so that's one of the things. I don't use reconstituted aloe like a lot of these sunscreen companies where they, they actually take powdered aloe and they add water to it. Add water to it. Right? Right? Um, and then, of course, the other thing is we, we don't source anything out of any place like China. We get gamma arisenol from France. We get our L-arginine from Japan. And so, you know, it's really hard to find good sources of, you know, raws so that all of it is not contaminated. Um, and we've been tempted many times to save money to buy raws, but in every case, the quality control on them is horrible. I, I got long stories about L-arginine that we got from China, horrible stuff. Um, I mean, it's just bad. The one thing you alluded to also is the fact that they have subcomponents. They yeah. have they come with ingredients. You're buying a raw ingredient. Like if you, you're, I'm buying aloe vera, but there's other stuff in it when right. I'm getting it from a chemical company. That's exactly right. Well. You know, without chemicals, life itself would be impossible, we like to say. So, so, so Birch Bees said, we are chemical free. And I said, no, you're not chemical free. You're, you might be toxic free, but I don't know about chemical free. I said, everybody, you know, H2O is a chemical and that's water and you're still going to use water. So, so I like to say that, you know, I, I had to come up with a way in the patent literature because, you know, patents are all about lexicography, you know, making up pro proper words. So I started to say, look, it has to be earth grown ingredients only. Now those earth grown ingredients are chemical compositions, but they're not synthetic because they're not necessarily made by man. However, <laughs> almond oil, most people consider almond oil, especially if it's organic almond oil to be a natural, you know, organic ingredient. But the problem is I've never seen a pool of almond oil on the planet. So even almond oil has to be, you know, manufactured, right? It has, to, you have to do something to it to get the oil out of it, right? So Burt's Bees, you know, said, well, we're non-synthetic. I said, well, you have to define what that is. Uh, Cause I'm data driven. I'm an engineer. I'm not a, a chemist. I'm a scientist. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm a little bit too much of a nerd for these people, right? Because, you know, green is a marketing term as I teach in my class here at Duke. And, and nanotechnology, again, what is nanotechnology? These all have, are good marketing terms for the general public, but when push comes to shove, how do you really make something that's, you know, really non-toxic and quote unquote, it can be quote unquote chemical free, but, but that doesn't really mean anything to somebody who's a chemist, right? So, so I had to really come up with a way to, to really stick by what it was that the patent said, which is earth grown ingredients only. Now, of course, L-arginine is synthetic because let's face it, you're not growing L-arginine in a plant or a tree. You have to, you have to extract it. 
Same thing with the uh, jojoba oil, which we use, olive oil, which we use. Those are all extracted oils. And as you probably also know, some of these oils are extracted with hexane. Well, hexane definitely is toxic. In fact, hexane is sort of uh, the main component of gasoline. But the problem is, you, you, know, you don't have to buy it that way. But, you know, so olive oil can be extracted and the good stuff we buy is using water. Uh, same thing with the uh, jojoba oil. You can use water to do extraction and as your solvent rather than hexane. And so those are important considerations because we had to go and get uh, Leaping Bunny certified, which was not easy. It took us 18 months. And with Leaping Bunny, you had to go all the way back to the source of the source of the source. In other words, you have to go all the way back to the original manufacturer. Where do they source the L-arginine from to begin with? In other words, how are they making L-arginine? And of course, if you can imagine going through a Jinomoto, which is a Japanese company we get it from, and getting them to fill out the paperwork wasn't easy. They don't want to fill out that paper. In fact, they got to find somebody in the company who even knows how to fill out the paperwork. Anyway, so we got Leaping Bunny approval about mm, six or seven years ago. And then PETA, PETA loves us because of it, because no animal testing. So Leaping mm, yeah. Bunny is sort of together with PETA about making sure there's no animal testing, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, let me ask you about another one of them. Sure, sure. Ah, D3K2. Okay. <laughs> so D3K2. So first of all, I didn't know this. All right, first of, well, well, first of all, how, how do we use this? Well, it's a great oh. question. So do I need to give it a shake? Uh, not really. You could, but I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, homogeneous. But yeah, you can okay, shake and it. Then, I mean, there's no reason not to shake it. What were the directions? I didn't read the <laughs> Well, Okay, well, the, the, the bottom line is you can't overdose on D3K2, really. But that D3K2 is made with citric acid. So we chelate the D3 with citric acid. And then we add the K2, and we solubilize it all, and that's what you've got there. And, you know, we recommend like an eyedropper full a day. But, of course, again, you know, in sunny Florida where you're getting 20 minutes of daylight, how much vitamin D do you need? Of course, in the wintertime, when it dark, gets dark early and you're in the northern uh, hemisphere, you're going to need vitamin D. Well, I also found out by a lot of reading that without K2, vitamin D absorption is pretty minimal. So what we did with this was we, I said, well, I can make it even better. <laughs> I can make the absorption even better. So we chelate it with citric acid. Citric acid is part of the Krebs cycle, which gives ATP to the cells. And you probably know about that. You're, you're nodding your head. So citric acid uh, is what we also use to chelate the silver oxide. So I had the experience of chelating the silver oxide with citric acid. And then I said, well, I can apply that same technique to vitamin D3, which we buy as a powder and solubilize and then chelate with citric acid. Chelation now, are you putting it? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Are you putting it in a, in a drink when you take it? Or are you uh, putting it oh, under your tongue question. right uh, from the dropper? That's a great question. I, either way. Me personally, I, I, I use it as a, as a sort of a tincture. It's not alcohol based. As you know, it's water based, but yeah, you could, you could add it to, you know, you could add it to a glass of water, you know. It tastes very good too. It's got a, a citrusy taste, right? Yeah. 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 And the citric acid right. is something that um, mm -hmm. <laughs> people don't realize most citric acid comes from corn, not from citrus. Wow. So um <laughs> So citrus has ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, but it also has citric acid, which is not ascorbic acid. But so we get it from non-GMO corn. We believe that they, they tell us that I can't guarantee that because that's what it says on the package. And we get it from the same company every time, but it's very pure. And of course people say, well, wait a minute, I have a corn allergy. I don't think I should do this. I said, look, this is so far removed from corn that even if you have a corn allergy, citric acid is not going to harm you because of a corn allergy. We use the citric acid to chelate the silver to make silver citrate, which is that little bottle, that 4,000 part per million product, uh, which I think you saw. And that's how this whole chelation thing started. First by chelating the zinc oxide with L-arginine and then chelating the silver oxide with the citric acid. So those are, again... If you don't know chelation, it's basically a mild reaction. It's something that, um, you know, <laughs> what's the right way to say this? It's not, um, it's not a very exothermic reaction. It's, 
it, it, it's not something that's going to immediately occur. It's, it's a slow reaction and it's a mild reaction. So for example, when we chelate the zinc oxide with the L-arginine, we let the bucket sit in solution for at least 24 to 48 hours before mm. we remove the water. Um, and that's how we make this zinc oxide paste. So did I answer all your D3K2 questions? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, you did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so the D3K2 is a supplement that you can take once, twice, three times a day. Eyedropper full, we recommend at a time. I think it's 4,000 IUs, which is, it sounds like a lot. It's not very much. You're not we're in Florida. OD we that. might, yeah, we're in Florida. We probably make 20,000 units in 15 minutes outside oh, in the yeah, sun. Who go. knows? So yeah, so you know, it's not much. And then, um, and then we also make the chelated zinc oxide. Yes, the high Z, we call it. That one you have to be careful with. And the reason for that is zinc, you can OD on zinc pretty easily. So we recommend on that no more than, you know, five or 10 drops a day. And I mean drops, not the whole, if you're, right. <laughs> we, had, we had a guy that a, was- a dropper, a dropper full is about 30 drops. That's right. You don't want to use a full eyedropper full every day, uh, unless you've got some weird thing going on, like, you know, you got some kind of infection or you've got- a cold or, or some kind of virus you're fighting, then your body may need more zinc. But if you do 30 drops a day for several days or even a couple of weeks, you'll start getting a stomach ache. And, and it okay. is, you can overdose on zinc. So I have to why, be why did you make this product? Why? Um, again, I, <laughs> well, it's a couple of reasons. The reason that this whole thing started with me is I had some prostate problems in my twenties and I was taking zinc oxide, actually zinc for my prostate health through Dr. Schmidt and they were making a tablet. And then people said, well, wait a minute, you know, what kind of zinc are you, are you taking? And is, and it, is it bioabsorbable? And so I said, well, you know, I, I could make my own bioabsorbable zinc and there it is. And it's a, a zinc chelate with zinc citrate instead of zinc, for example, zinc picolinate or zinc sulfate. You know, there's a lot of different forms of zinc where some of it is very bioactive and bioavailable. Well, with citric acid, I know it's very bioactive and bioavailable. But right. I, 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 I made something that's a highly concentrated because honestly, uh, to dilute the concentrated product that I make, which is at 4,000 parts per million, I dilute this 32 to one to get the concentrate that you see there, which is you can look at it. It's mostly water, right? But it's soluble and it's bioactive and bioavailable. And I don't believe, and this is, something that I've studied up on and believe to be true. I believe if you're going to take supplements, you want to take as many of the liquid based supplements as possible, because otherwise you're not going to get the bioabsorption and the bioavailability that you're hoping for. And, you know, you spend a lot of money on supplements that are rocks and don't do anything, but, you know, maybe sit in your gut and pass through and, yeah. you know, but, but I've also found that if you use phospholipids, for example, Sometimes you want that to happen, that you want the uh, supplement to uh, disperse in the lower intestinal tract. And the good way to do that is use phospholipids to prevent it from absorption on the way down. Most of our competitors in this industry, in this supplement and natural food industry, are people that are there to make a buck and they go to the laboratories and they say, uh, I need a vitamin c product right oh yeah we got that here i need a vitamin d product we got that yeah sure we can put your name on it and and they have no idea what they're actually getting and talking to you it's like wait a second no i'm making it because of this and this is why i'm making it this right. way and i have the chemical understanding and knowing what's going to happen with it it's very very cool <laughs> now i'm guessing that at five drops a day this is probably about a one-year supply <laughs> good point and there and therein lies a problem in terms of profitability, but yes. I'm Dr. Haley interrupting this podcast to share this month's special at HaleyNutrition.com. Use the coupon code S2024. That's S2024 for $25 off your purchase of $200 or more now through the end of September 2024. If you haven't tried the Aya Greens vegetable and fruit powder yet, you're missing out each scoop of powder has the antioxidant equivalent of 
more than 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. You're gonna love them, they taste great, you're gonna feel great, you're gonna be full of energy. Head over to HaleyNutrition.com and add a canister of greens to your cart today. Now back to the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Ah, Nutrisport. Yeah, why do we have two flavors? Yeah, two flavors. Again, the same reason that Michelle and you use the lip balm. So remember, the lip balm is water-resistant and water-soluble, right? So you got a water-soluble Nutrisporin and a water-resistant Nutrisporin, and the question is why? Well, that's a, a little bit of a story too. So turns out what we're doing with the Nutrisporin is we're taking the chelated silver oxide that I've mentioned but have not described, and we infuse that into this Nutrolium base. So again, food grade edible. The green box has three ingredients, okay? Soteroglucoside, which is the plant fat we talked about for the Neutroleum product. Um, glycerin, USP grade kosher glycerin, which by the way is very expensive and food grade edible, of course. And then uh, the chelated silver oxide with citric acid. Well, when you make that three way combination, you make something that we did call rash block and we still do. The rash block only has 75 parts per million silver. The Nutrisporin has 100 parts per million silver. But nobody knew what rash block was or how to use it, but people understand Neosporin. So putting on my IP hat again, I said, you know, if I use Nutrisporin as a product name, I better get it trademarked. And sure enough, I did. And Johnson & Johnson, for whatever reason, did not oppose the trademark. And so it is a registered trademark. And it is, says on the box not to be confused by, with Neosporin for a reason. That's a legal issue. We can talk about that either now or some other time. And it turns out that that product will heal just about any cut, bruise, scrape, anything you have, and it will heal it fast. <laughs> so yeah, you're squeezing it out of the tube and putting it on your finger. And uh, if you've got any kind of boo-boo, it will heal the boo-boo. <laughs> wow. And uh, it is, as you can see, a pretty clear gel, a little sticky, but as opposed to Neosporin, which is a triple biotic gel made with petroleum jelly, <laughs> petrolatum, right? right? Uh, obviously not food grade edible. And the antibiotics are not very good because it turns out that Neosporin, and you can look this up on Wikipedia. I can't believe they've never taken it down after 15, 20 years. It turns out that Neosporin is a triple biotic gel and that those triple biotics, those antibiotics, they wipe out certain strains of bacteria, but they don't touch others. They don't touch, for example, MRSA. And because they don't touch MRSA, when you put Neosporin on, it allows MRSA to proliferate because MRSA has no other competitors in the space. So what happens is- Yeah, when you kill off the competition, when you MRSA's kill off the competition, free to do its own thing. That's it. So people don't realize Muhammad Ali died of MRSA in the hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. And the reason that they don't realize that is because if the hospital released that information, they would have lost their federal and state funding because MRSA is associated with dirt and filth. And of course, you being in your profession know that that's not the case. MRSA is everywhere. E. coli is everywhere. Well, guess what? Our chelated silver oxide wipes out all infectious bacteria, all fungus, all mold, all mildew, including MRSA, including E. coli. And then we got the magic call, which still Seven years later, it's hard to believe. A woman called me from Bremerton, Washington. She's an LPN, licensed practical nurse. At the time, she's retired now. She ran two, med two nursing care facilities in Bremerton, Washington. And she said, this stuff is wiping out my UTI, Gary, urinary tract infection. And I want to try it on my residents. I said, Sue, how fast do you need it? Where do you want me to ship it? Uh, long story short, 2017, 2018, we did a study on her residents. They had 12 women there that at different times had UTI. One woman was on hospice. She was getting UTI every single week. She was getting antibiotics every single week. They applied this directly on the urethra, dime size, three times a day to her. She never got another UTI. She lived nine more months in the nursing care facility without ever getting another UTI. I've got yeah. at least 10 to 15 women in the last three years that have contacted me that had the same issue, UTI goes away, gone. But of course, could I advertise that? Yes, I could, and then go to FDA jail. 
So yeah, I'm I'm a little confused because sure. you talked about a you you just described it as a topical application. I did. I did. So they didn't have to ingest a silver product and flush it out from the inside. That is correct. Although although we did supply to the nursing care facility the big blue bottle. Did I send you the big blue bottle? No, oh, I think I just the big blue bottle is the ready to drink silver. I think I just sent you the little silver. Yeah. So that one eyedropper full of that in eight ounces of water makes 150 part per million ready to drink silver oxide solution. And yes, you can ingest it. And if you ever, ever, ever get even the tinge of food poisoning, it will wipe it out. Like now, how is literally. it? Because understanding that it's uh, gonna take out all kinds of bacteria. Yes. How is it safe when it comes to ingesting in your gut flora? Yep. Great question. So here's what I tell people. I say, look, <laughs> every time you take a breath and every time you drink something and eat something, you're going to get bacteria into your body, right? Good and bad. The key is, can your immune system overcome the bad, the infectious stuff? And of course, if your immune system is optimal, it's going to wipe most of that infectious stuff out. But you know, there's no question that there's a link between infectious bacteria and cancer, stomach cancer, kidney cancer, you name the cancer. How many types of cancer are there? How many times of bacteria are there? Infectious bacteria is the question and the need. Now, as far as good bacteria in your gut is concerned, I would say if you want to take a pre and probiotic to make sure you maintain good, healthy gut, I do. I like it. I think it's a great idea to do it. Do you need to do it? Depends on your diet, depends on your exercise routine, depends on everybody's different. Even identical yeah. twins have a different DNA. So I would say the answer is, yeah, it could wipe out some good bacteria. The question is, how much is it going to wipe out and will it affect you in any negative way? And I would say probably not as long as you're drinking, eating and breathing good, clean stuff. Um, right. You know, nurture the good flora back and yeah, give the good exactly. flora the things I, it needs. And I, and I would say to you, some people, my sister, for example, uses it proactively. She'll take it in the morning and the evening before she goes to bed. She'll take, you know, some silver uh, to wipe out any infectious stuff. And I think, you know, not a bad idea to do that. Is it causing her any issues? She claims it's keeping her healthy. But again, you know, she's indoors in New England a lot. She's got dogs and she had kids and blah, blah, blah. So I think it all depends how you want to use it, when you want to use it. We were at a wedding. This is like 10 years ago in Germany. It was the hottest day of the year in Cologne, Germany. Both my parents are from there. And we were at this wedding and at 11 o'clock at night, it's an all day, all night affair, right? 11 o'clock at night, I'm looking around for my wife at the time and I'm saying, what, you know, where is she, you know? And she's outside at a picnic table with her head down. She couldn't even raise her head. So at three o'clock in the morning, we had to take her to the bride's house, which is where we stayed. She woke up at three o'clock the next day after she took a full glass of the chelated silver with the water. She woke up at 12 hours later hungry. Now, if you've ever gotten food poisoning, you know, the first thing you wake up thinking about is what is it that I ate or drank that I'll never touch again? Right. So I swear to you that if you ever feel like you had something in your body that you don't want in there anymore and your body tells you pretty quickly, that is the antidote. That silver oxide, drinking it, ingesting it is the antidote. But getting back to your original question about urinary tract infection, we have all the evidence that you don't need to do both. But if it's an acute infection, we recommend both. I had a woman come to me at Dave Osprey's conference in uh, Orlando four years ago. And I had just done an interview like I'm doing with you guys with two women who were running around the conference interviewing people. And they found this woman, a young woman, 25 years old about, who had just come from Oregon. She was in the elevator and they wanted to interview her about her experience at the conference. And she said, I can't do that. I'm, and she was not doing well. She said, I was in the emergency room all last night. I have a, a blooming UTI. They just gotten through interviewing me and sent her directly to my booth. She came and it was probably, I'm going to say two o'clock in the afternoon, one o'clock in the afternoon when she saw me, it was right after lunch. And I told her here, here's what you need. She bought the bottle, the big blue bottle, which is like I said, the, the ready to drink version of what you showed me. And she took a tube of Nutrisporin. At 10 o'clock the next morning, I had pictures on my phone of her. She came downstairs and she was beaming from ear to ear. It was gone. <laughs> and it was gone overnight. And they told her in the emergency room, you probably shouldn't go to the conference. 
you probably should just fly back to Oregon. <laughs> so, so, uh, let, and I have several stories like that. That one was the one let, I have the most anecdotal evidence of. But of course, Sue Honan, the, the lady who was running the two nursing care facilities, we actually have a doctor out in Bremerton. He's a Seventh Day Adventist, and he actually prescribes Nutrisporin for his nursing care, uh, what they call residents, right? Because they, one of the, re and so why is there an, a water resistant version? Well, I always made a water resistant version for many reasons. It stays on longer, it's more topical, it doesn't soak in as quickly. But Sue said to me, could you just make a Nutrisporin product that stays on the skin longer? Because my other facility has incontinent, not only urinary tract incontinence, they have bowel incontinence because they are mentally handicapped. They have Parkinson's and, you know, MS and Alzheimer's, right? And so they're, they were bowel incontinence. She says, I need something that stays on longer. I said, well, I got it, Sue. I'll just make the water resistant Nutrisporin version. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So the difference between this and the big blue bottle yes. is concentration. Correct. That's the only difference. So now, from my perspective, if I'm going to purchase something, yep. it makes sense to get a smaller container yep. with less water. A hundred percent correct. I, that is what you're holding in your hand is three times less costly than buying the ready to drink product. But there are many people who are not like us who just want a ready to drink thing. They don't. They don't want to think, they don't want to have to dilute. They don't want to, you know, how many eyedroppers full and blah, blah, blah. They just don't want to deal with it. And so we make a ready to drink product, which we sell on Amazon. And that's probably the only thing on Amazon we make money on. But of course it's a pain in the ass because pardon my language, but we have to package it so it doesn't break. And so, and of course right. the other thing is what you have in your hand, you can travel anywhere with, and you can't travel anywhere with a 16 ounce bottle. Now we also make a little spray version of the big blue bottle, which I think I may have sent you the little spray blue sprayer, which looks identical to the big blue bottle, which is the refill so that you can carry with that with you on the plane. Of course, that's just a spray of 150 parts per million anywhere you want. And I don't know if you wanted me to explain the difference between our chelated silver oxide and the colloidal silver. I, I do want to know the difference, okay. but first I want to talk about the applications that you just um, sure. mentioned, because if I had a spray, I might use it if I had a sore throat. I might spray it in my sore throat. Exactly. I might spray it on my skin topically if I thought I had something that, you know, was growing there that shouldn't. And I, I, I might squirt it up my nose or, <laughs> or in my ears That's right. if I had an ear infection. That's exactly right. We, we also make a deodorant spray. And so we use the same exact formulation, except we add jojoba oil and aloe. And if you spray that in your mouth, it's just tastier. And uh, it's, a, it's a little different, right? The deodorant spray is identical except for those two added ingredients, right? All right, so, very, very cool. Yep, yep. So, but-, but what, What's the you, concentration difference on so this that, one? What you're holding in your hand is 4,000 parts per million. Uh, what we sell ready to drink is 150 parts per million. And you would say, well, okay. why is that? We did testing uh, to determine what was our sweet spot where at some concentration, the silver did what it needed to do, which is wipe out to the six sigma, in other words, 99.999% bacteria, fungus, mildew, whatever. And what we found was our sweet spots between 75 and 200 parts per million. And above that, above 200 parts per million, it didn't do anything more or more effective. And below 75 parts per million, it wasn't quite as effective. So we picked- So this could make about a gallon. That, oh, that'll make, uh, so one of those, one eye, one eyedropper full will make eight ounces and there's about 30 eyedropper fulls. So whatever 30 times eight, that's 240 ounces. So it's oh, more okay. like a couple yeah, gallons. It's almost two gallons. Yes. Almost two gallons of, of 150 part per million product. Yes. Yeah. And I could imagine how much it would be to have two glass containers of gal you know, gallons of, uh, water shipped. So, and you know, it's going to break and right. All those things right? makes so much more sense. So that, yeah, it, yeah, obviously carrying that around is easy. And of course we make that little two ounce sprayer to carry around. And I, you know, I, during COVID, I carried it everywhere in the airport on the airplane. I always tell people, I think the airplane is actually cleaner than the airport because the airplanes have, you know, HEPA filters and the airports don't. <laughs> so I think, and, oh, I think it was more of an airport related illness than an airplane related illness. <laughs> That could be a hand sanitizer. It's absolutely. And as you know, maybe, you know, 
hand sanitizers by definition have to be 60% alcohol. Hmm. Right. And so, but we don't use alcohol, so we can't call it a hand sanitizer. I mean, it, it, there's all these rules and regulations that the FDA and the EPA put on all these things. And uh, that's why being in this space is very difficult. Yeah. The, Alcohol is what is the skin irritant, which is why they have to put aloe in it to counter those harmful effects of the rubbing alcohol you on your skin it. all the you time. Got it. Absolutely. You know, I, these products are great. Um, I'm going to start using yours. I have been using another brand, okay. but tell me the difference. Well, okay. But so we keep it in the house. So we we use it for everything, like you said. It right, right, first right, right. So, time we, you know, we think something's going wrong. We're having some. We're mm -hmm. drinking it. We're squirting it up our nose, whatever, it, wherever we need it. But what, yeah, what's the difference between yours and everything else that we're seeing on the shelves? Um, all right. So I'm guessing what you're seeing on the shelves and what you're buying is colloidal silver. Uh, there's a few companies out there that sell it. Uh, Sovereign silver, silver wings. And I will tell you very straight, very transparent. There's nothing wrong with those products. They work. Um, you don't need a high concentration of silver for it to be effective. They're selling mostly 10 parts per million and they're selling colloidal silver. We are selling chelated silver oxide, which is bioactive and bioavailable because we're bonding the silver molecule to an organic citric acid molecule. What they're selling is something that's made with two electrodes. I, I simplify it in a bathtub. They're using either deionized water or distilled water. They're running a current between the two electrodes and one electrode is coated with silver and the other electrode is just uh, either positive or negative charged uh, anode or cathode. When you run the electricity through, what happens is the silver ions migrate from the silver uh, coated electrode to the one that's not. And as they migrate through the water, they get trapped in the water and those are silver ions. They're silver particles in water and they're charged, normally positively charged silver ions, which is very helpful. And at 10 parts per million, there's evidence that it wipes out things like viruses and, you know, flus and uh, cold bugs and that kind of stuff. The problem with it is, if there is a problem, which I don't know that there's necessarily a problem, but the difference is that it's not bioactive and bioavailable. So when, okay. you, when you add the citric acid molecule, now all of a sudden it's becoming bioactive and bioavailable, right? And so all of a sudden, now you have something that when it gets to the cell wall, instead of just penetrating the cell wall and going through the cell and wiping out whatever it can, it sticks to the cell wall and stays there until it wipes out whatever the heck it is it needs to wipe out. And eventually those cells either die or they get renewed and they get flushed out or something happens. There's a, you know, there's a theory, there's a body of evidence that says every cell in our body, and we have trillions, has a function. Some cells need to die and, and be removed. Some cells uh, need to be born and be new. You know, we've heard about zombie cells, which I don't really understand, but supposedly they exist. But you have nose cells and you have eye cells and you have ear cells and tongue cells, and, you know, skin cells. And all those cells have different functions. And if any of those cells get infected with bacteria or with fungus or mildew or mold, you'd like to have something that would be there long enough to wipe it out and make the cell healthy again. And with the citric acid, you're feeding the cell. So in my view, the colloidal silver that you're taking, if, if that's what it is, and, and, and at low, low, low concentrations, 10 parts per million is 99.999% water that they're selling, but still has effectiveness. Uh, it, right. it, it can be good. It just really depends. Like nebulizing colloidal silver during <laughs> seemed to wipe it out. And I have papers to prove that. They weren't written in the United States. They're Spanish, Japanese, and, and Israeli papers, but they prove that silver can wipe out um, <laughs> But unfortunately- I, I, you know, I did hear about that, about, you know, yes. nebulizing. Yes. You know, and- Yes, and so you could nebulize our stuff too. And I did actually, and it, it seemed to help me when I got And it was in Florida actually, and uh, it's not pleasant. And I did nebulize with the silver and it did help, especially because I got the kind that taste- <laughs> and smell went away. Um, but anyway, that's a whole, that's a whole different discussion, but, um, getting back to your, yeah, uh, and, and, and we're going to have to beep that word out if we put yeah, this on YouTube, true, right? I'm sorry. I should have said, no, uh, no, no, it's okay. The pandemic, the <laughs> pandemic.
um, whatever. But the bottom line is what I would say is there's a, another problem with colloidal silver. You can't make a high concentration of it uh, and, and sell it because it turns brown and yellow. It oxidizes. Uh, they, the, the, there, some of them have been making up to 250 to 500 parts per million of colloidal, but that takes forever. It costs them a, a lot of money and time to make it because they got to pour a bunch of power into the electrodes and they got to wait for the colloidal silver ions to get into the water. And I would imagine to make 250 parts per million of colloidal silver probably takes a minimum of several weeks to make that product. So what now, if it is we, brown and oxidized, does that make it any less? Well, beneficial? that's a good question. I, 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 the answer is I don't know. I'm sure there's probably some information out there that says that you really want it in the silver ion form because that's more potent to most of the bacteria, especially negatively charged bacteria. Once positively charged ions hit negatively charged bacteria, it wipes it out. So when you take a positively charged ion or a negatively charged ion and you oxidize it, it'll become silver oxide. And silver oxide, I would say is probably not as effective, although it, it brings back a story about how the French aristocracy got the name blue blood because they ate and drank off of silver and drank from silver goblets. Um, and it turns out they got bluish tinge to their blood because they got very, they were very white and very pale and their blood, their veins turned blue. You could actually see blue veins, bluish veins. What they don't tell you is that the Brit French aristocracy did not die from the bubonic plague, <laughs> right? Which was carried by, which was bacteria carried by rats. That was proven. So, uh, so, you know, it's interesting. And so silver oxide will turn you blue over time. There was a guy in Kentucky turned himself into a Smurf took him many years to do it, and he died of a heart attack. He did not die of something called arginosis, which is what the FDA has tried to scare everybody about, saying, oh, you're going to get silver poisoning. Well, good luck getting silver poisoning. You're going to have to drink like 10 glasses of silver a day for the next 10 years to turn yourself blue. But if you want to do it, you can yeah, do the, it. The blue guy was experimenting with it. And I, what? from what I understand, he was making his own and – yep. Uh, you know, yep. it, and he it turned himself him. into a Smurf, but then he died of a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well, this is good stuff. Uh, I love your products. Third Rock Essentials. So it's 3RBROCK Essentials.com. That's the website. All right. right. Yeah. Excellent, Gary. Yeah, we're also on Amazon, Gary, but you. we really prefer to people go to our website because Amazon takes a big, big chunk of our gross. Yeah, and uh, you got to avoid the big evil machine if you can, the evil empire. That's right. Hey, they're putting a big beating on us. On yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. But, you know, some people want it next day. If you go to our website, you can get it next day because we stock Amazon with enough so that uh, if you order from our website, Amazon will ship it to you directly. Yeah, and I'm just going to say to anybody that made it this far in the podcast, um, <laughs> you shouldn't need this overnight. You should... This is, these are products that should be in your house at all times. Right. Um, you, you don't want to, you know, say, oh, all of a sudden I, I need to order the Nutrispore and, you know, I have an infection. Can we overnight it? Well, when you have an infection and you want to apply it, you want it right there and then. You don't <laughs> want it tomorrow. Right. Keep it in your house. You don't know when you're going to get food poisoning. That's right. That's Keep right. Keep this in your house. Yes. Medicine cabinet. <laughs> exactly. Or we first aid kit when you're traveling, when you're hiking, when you're, you know, biking, whatever you're doing, you know, you should have you should have something at your disposal. We used to sell a first aid kit, but we didn't have a lot of demand for it, so it's better to put your own together. Actually, now, do these things expire? Great question. The answer is no, they don't. But again, with the FDA, we have to be careful. So with the sunscreen, you have to put an expiration date on. So we put three years because we know that nothing changes in three years. Those products are completely shelf stable forever because there's nothing that can grow in there. Uh, in other words, no bacteria that causes shelf life instability. And the product itself is only three ingredients, which are so uh, shelf stable that we've got stuff sitting around now for five, seven, 10 years, nothing changes. So we haven't put an expiration date on the Nutrisporin products or on the silver because we haven't seen any reason to do it. 
We haven't talked about the liver cleanse. That's a, that was a little bit different because that's got four Hawaiian herbs in it, um, some silver, and, uh, and actually we had a fungus that started growing there, which was turned out to not be an infectious fungus. It turned out to be a healthful fungus, but it grew a, a white cloud of fungus because they sent us the herbs from the Hawaiian farm unfiltered in large quantities. Like mm -hmm. we bought two gallon bags and they didn't tell us that the stuff they were selling online in little one and two ounce bottles with eyedroppers were filtered and that the stuff they sent us was raw with no filtration. So we found out by selling the fungus out that the fungus is a pseudomongus fungus and it actually helps the uh, herbs grow in the soil and it's not toxic to humans. However, uh, that product shelf stable wise, we recommend six months because that one, if you don't keep it refrigerated and you don't keep it closed, you'll start to see potentially fungus growing, which is another reason why we've uh, gotten to the reformulation of that one. Cause nobody wants white cloudy fungus, you know, in their, in their liver cleanse product. <laughs> we'll eat mushrooms, but that's right. That's right. And of course, nothing wrong with that. Although I guess there is, was it lysergic acid? Like, like, what is it? Something acid LC, LSD, right? Uh, in mushrooms, I guess, I guess some form of it. Well, the psilocybin, something like that. Something um, like that. And lysergic acid. Silly, I think, silly, silly cybin. Yeah. Maybe so it makes that, you yeah. silly. Of course, uh, again, that probably won't kill you. It might, uh, it might expand your mind a little bit. <laughs> it might expand your mind, give you new product ideas. Um, <laughs> Boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right. I love it. Um, how often do you do the liver cleanse? Uh, that's, we recommend that every night uh, before you go to bed. Um, only because it affected everybody's liver. Uh oh, I said the word again. Uh, the, <laughs> I would say everybody's uh, liver has been affected by the epidemic. Um, and so cleansing the liver is a good thing. What's in there is magnesium citrate, which cleanses the liver, and then four herbs that support the liver. Okay. You, you think people have been affected whether they got naturally or use the, that other, the, the V word. Uh -huh. Good question. My understanding is I would imagine they got, they got, the liver was affected in, in both circumstances. And the reason why is, you know, the liver is your largest internal organ and it's a filter, right? So anything that goes into your bloodstream is eventually going to wind up being purified by the liver somehow. And so if your bloodstream is contaminated in any way, shape or form by any virus or any, you know, bacteria or whatever, the liver is going to get involved. So, you know, keeping your liver healthy is vital to keeping your, all your organs and all your internal parts of your body healthy, including your skin, which is your largest organ. So I would say for the liver cleanse, I mean, to maintain good health, you know, use it, use it, an eyedropper full of a night or even twice, once in the morning, once in the evening. I think I may have told you the story offline, but I have a, a patent attorney friend from Korea and he works all day drinking and doing business development and he drinks a lot <laughs> and, and he buys drinks for everybody. So he's fun to be around. But uh, then he goes up and he works in his room for four hours because when he's in the United States anyway, you know, it's a 12 hour difference between here and Korea. And uh, he said to me, uh, do you have that? We call it, we call it hangover block too. He goes, you got that hangover block? I want to try that stuff. I said, sure, Jay, no problem. Uh, he said, well, let me have one bottle. He says, what should I do? I said, in your case, before you go to bed tonight, you drink the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, okay, okay, I'll do that. And then I want to meet you down here in the lobby at the elevator at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And of course there was eight o'clock the next morning and I'm at the elevator waiting for him to come down. He's got the uh, liver cleanse in his hand. It's empty. And he said, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so no hangover. So yeah. So if you decide oh, you want to get, no. uh, you want to you, you imbibe more than you normally more. would, then yeah, use it. <laughs> wow. Any new products uh, in the pipeline? Uh, yes. Uh, what about uh, a Yes. And I don't know if I sent you any of these. Uh, we make something with an intelligent thread guys. Um, we started out with them. They wanted a, a pain relief gel. We call it attention release gel because pain release again is an FDA no, no, uh, we use Arnica and we infuse the Arnica into the neutroleum gel and we call it attention release gel. And that's pretty new. We've only been doing that for about a year 
And then they said, you know, Gary, we have a lot of uh, customers. They sell clothing with infused energy in it that really does have an effect on a lot of people that have problems walking or pain in some joints or neck or whatever. And they said, but we also have clients that really like to look good. Can you make us, uh, you know, sort of, sort of a night serum? And so we do. We make a, a night serum now. And it uses, instead of retinol A, it uses bacuchinol which is, you know, again, a plant-derived extract. We say if you wouldn't put it in your mouth, don't put it on your skin. And the hyaluronic acid. So those are the two. And it's in basically a watered-down version of our Neutroleum gel. You know, it's more for vanity. It's a wrinkle cream, I call it. But it's, it's called Night Serum. And it's, uh, again, we co-brand that with uh, Intelligent Threads. And that's, those are the newest products that we've developed. And okay. I have a product stuff. idea that I have to bounce off you. I want you to make it and I want my company name on it. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Well, we do some private labeling as well, um, as we talked about. So yeah, that's, so you won't, you don't want to share that on this, on this uh, podcast. Nope, not yet. <laughs> Gary, thank you so much. I've been uh, definitely in an informative time. Love the products. We're fans and now customers. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Any way I can help in the future, we'll be in close touch and Anybody who watches this, you know, just third, thirdrockessentials.com, go to the website. Uh, you can sign up as an affiliate. You can get a 20% discount, a 20% commission. There's no pyramid scheme. There's no minimum order requirement. It's just because Amazon takes so much of our money that we offer the affiliate program, which is thirdrockstar.com. So you can sign up there right. what, and get a 20% commission for everything that everybody uses your code and you get a 20% discount for any of the products that we, uh, that we manufacture and we sell. That sounds so, great. Um, I'm going to become an affiliate. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on the Dr. Haley show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode. <laughs>